Hello and welcome to The Green Stream, a podcast brought to you by Sustainable Business Network Detroit, a network of partnerships between Southeast Michigan stakeholders, innovators, and changemakers. Each partner is on a mission to advance and amplify sustainable business practices, and we're here to learn from, share, and help activate a sustainable way forward for Greater Detroit. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review and join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And head over to our website, sbn-detroit.org. Now, let's listen in to our conversation with today's sustainability leaders. Well, welcome to the Green Stream, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Terry Barclay, President and CEO of Inforum and Chair of the Sustainable Business Network of Detroit. And I am just really, really looking forward to today's conversation. We're so thrilled that Maria Mercedes Galarza, who is Deputy Director of the Office of Sustainability for the City of Detroit, is our guest today. And let me just tell you a little bit about Maria, but I'm hoping she's going to tell us some more about her career journey and what led her to the role that she's in today. But Maria is a registered architect and urban planner. And most recently, she led the engagement for the planning of the first resilience hub for backup solar energy storage in the city of Detroit. Really looking forward to hearing more about that. She has a dual master's degree in architecture and urban and regional planning from the University of Michigan. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Terry. It's so good to be here. So, so tell us, tell us about, you know, um, share with us your background story and how you ended up in this role. What led you to this? Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, you know, doing this um, job has been such a privilege for the last uh, almost a year now. Um, I have been with the city of Detroit for seven years. Uh, So, you know, uh, I'm earning my career chops uh, doing public service uh, and in municipal government and, and truly has been a passion. Uh, If you were to ask me, you know, was your career going to end up in municipal government? Uh, I probably would have guessed not. Uh, I grew up sort of really interested in neighborhoods. Uh, I'm originally from Quito, Ecuador, very walkable city. I uh, immigrated to the U.S. when I was 13 to Houston, Texas, out of all places. Um, You know, a place where there was definitely a neighborhood with not a lot of sidewalks. I'll say that. (laughs) And so it was definitely a culture shock. And I think that really, in hindsight, guided sort of like my passion to really figure out how to create communities that are really vibrant and, you know, uh, were reminiscent of how I grew up. Um, Somewhere down the line, I figured architecture was a path because I, you know, figured it was had to do with the built environment and I was really interested in uh, design. So I, I pursued an architecture degree and later in life, I discovered sort of urban planning and urbanism uh, and got really interested in that. And so I started my career working in architecture, you know, earning my chops and learning, you know, all the things, buildings, uh, you know, building envelope, energy, uh, construction, engineering, um, got my license in architecture recently. So, you know, all that uh, information is really fresh in my mind as I transition to this new role. But uh, really, I never thought sort of combining my architecture degree and my urban planning degree would be so useful. And it has been really through um, a journey of discovery and, and endless curiosity that I have ended up in the sustainability office. Uh, when my colleague, Joel, pursued another opportunity outside the city, our previous director, uh, you know, he delegated the climate strategy onto me um, as a project. And I completely sort of fell in love with the team that we were working with and with the project. Um, And, you know, I have really come to this work very humbly in, in learning all things sustainability, but also from a space of already understanding very much sort of the built environment. 
Boy, that is quite um, an, an arc of, of life and a career. I mean, uh, boy, all stunningly beautiful places. Um, and now you're in another stunningly beautiful place. <laughs> Right, we're we're so lucky to have have you with us. So, um, how do you see the sustainability initiative for the city as helping to transform the impact of citizens in the city? I know that that's one of your special areas of interest. Are really um, connecting people with this work? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of my work has been centered around sort of communities and creating vibrant communities and, and people are really at the center of that. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of with the climate strategy that was recently released is that, you know, unlike other sort of government documents or climate documents that can be really overwhelming and jargony, um, the climate strategy is really sort of people friendly and reader friendly. Uh, you know, it's fun to look at. It, it's fun to turn the pages or scroll if you're on, on your phone or, or, you know, on your computer. Um, and that's really important because how we communicate, uh, you know, our vision and our goals is the first start, you know, to people really, uh, one, becoming interested, but digging in, you know. Um, so we, we, you know, took a special attention to all the words, all the graphics to make sure that um, mm -hmm. it was um, something people felt enticed to like pick up and read. Because in this world where we all are uh, short of attention, short of time, uh, that was really important. So um, I think, you know, it, I, I would be remiss not to mention that this work builds on the leadership of community leaders already sort of doing amazing work in Detroit. Uh, you know, the city obviously has a role in setting out goals, but um, there's been work happening for decades already, you know, in the environmental advocacy space, uh, you know, creating and implementing projects, everything from stormwater uh, you know, to solar installations. Uh, I mean, that that level of leadership already exists in Detroit, and we're just really lucky to have um, champions that we can partner with and, and keep moving the, uh, those goals forward. You know, it's so wonderful to hear you mention that because we've had a number of those leaders on this podcast are featured in the SBND newsletter, and it really is impressive and humbling to see the multi-year commitment by citizens um, in the city uh, to this work. So thank you for sort of lifting that up and, and highlighting that. But but I'm hoping you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about the newly launched um, climate strategy framework. So I think there's four sort of pillars or four areas of work. Could could you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, we really uh, tried our hardest to um, summarize information in ways that are relatable. Uh, those four key sort of pillars and strategies are transitioning to clean energy. So if we think about clean energy, we think uh, solar, wind. Um, the second pillar is increasing sustainable mobility. Um, so, you know, we really came up with a sentence that encompassed, you know, micromobility, which are like scooters, uh, all the way to sort of public transit. Uh, so really, how do we think about these things holistically? The scooters, we'll have to talk about the scooters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and, you know, the, the third pillar is really around uh, accelerating energy efficiency um, and reducing waste. So if you think about energy as uh, a precious resource, you know, how do we uh, reduce the energy that sometimes is like literally seeping out our windows, seeping out of our roof, uh, but also thinking about waste in terms of material waste, you know, how do we start managing our materials, reducing the waste that we, you know, um, have at home, uh, you know, extending the life of things. Um, the last strategy is really uh, 
broad too in its uh, scope. It's around prioritizing vulnerable residents, and it really tries to get at the resilience of, of the city in terms of infrastructure, building the resilience of our communities, but also adapting to change because we know that you know, we are already uh, facing and, you know, struggling with the impacts of a warming planet. You know, how do we adapt what we know uh, as our normal life, quote unquote, and like, you know, gain new information, new skills um, to really protect ourselves, protect our family, their communities, and, you know, the things we love, our homes, our neighborhoods. So yeah. those are the key strategies. <laughs> So there's one project that sounds really innovative and cutting edge that I'd love to hear more about and understand better. Um, I think there's a program that the city is talking about introducing that would add battery storage and connect that with the energy being generated by solar fields in the city and store things at the buildings. Could you tell us more about what that's about? Sure. Uh, so currently we just opened a new building. Uh, it's a community center at 84 Park on the Lower East Side in the Jefferson Chalmers uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's an amazing project. It sort of hit every uh, portion of my sort of education and professional goals. Uh, we designed, uh, along with community input, uh, a building ground up that could serve as a community center. Um, and midway through sort of engagement, uh, you know, we were very conscious of what was happening in the neighborhood already in terms of flooding and flooding risks. Um, and we knew that community centers already serve as a central location for, for uh, residents and neighbors to come together, uh, you know, whether it's to fill sandbags, which was happening at 84 Park, or, you know, when we went through the COVID pandemic, you know, getting meals being distributed at community centers. So all of that, you know, were sort of activities that are part of resilience hubs, which is a term um, and sort of like an initiative, a program uh, to really include activities in buildings that could serve residents in times of crisis. So in times of extreme weather, um, but also can serve, you know, there are buildings that are there, uh, you know, for birthday parties or when you want to take a Zumba class. So really our trusted community spaces. Um, and the infrastructure piece on that is adding solar power uh, so that when there, there are outages, we, which we tend to experience here as well in Detroit uh, and also in the Jefferson Chalmers community, you know, how do you... Uh, or like what is that space that people go to, you know, that it's trusted space um, to get information, you know, if there's someone with medical needs that they can power any medical devices, uh, you know, or if it's extended periods of time, you know, how do you have that center of like communications for the neighborhood that you know has reliable power. Um, so that's a building that uh, you know, it's active right now. We have the solar panels are uh, on the roof and they are generating um, electricity to offset, you know, the day-to-day -day sort of energy, but also that energy is getting stored in a battery. So should the power go out, um, you know, the, the center will have a certain number of, of hours of electricity. So that is really awesome. It was a project that was a first for the city and, and we really hope to be able to replicate it um, as we think about new buildings needing roofs, new roofs, or um, as we see opportunities to, you know, um, get these buildings acting as resilience hubs. So it's been really great. <laughs> it's so exciting and what a great uh, concept um, to make those buildings hubs. And I think people just will naturally um, learn about the options that might be available as they look at their own um, lives and own residences. Um, so, but let's talk a little bit about how serious the challenges are and, um, you know, and, and how important the work is. 
So what does it really take in a practical sense to hit, for example, a three-year target from the city's perspective on launching a solar program that will generate clean energy for residents? What's involved with that? Yeah, it's, it's really monumental, uh, but the times call for it. Uh, we are definitely on a crunch uh, to get some results. And we are sort of living the impacts already as, as we know and have mentioned before. Uh, from sort of a leadership perspective, uh, the mayor is really zeroed in uh, on results, but he's also uh, really cognizant that uh, these sort of new technologies or new initiatives uh, require sort of community and community engagement. So um, he has launched a very bold uh, initiative to get residents to, you know, pitch whether they would like to see solar fields um, in their neighborhoods. Uh, and so that initiative is currently underway. You know, this is being sort of recorded on January 2024. Uh, we have um, selected nine sites across the city where residents have, um, you know, learned about what the solar fields could be, could look like, and they're excited to potentially welcome them into their communities. Um, that's just the first step, you know, uh, assembling sort of the, the land that's required. I mean, we, for so long, we have seen land as this sort of challenge in our city and, and the idea that it could be such an asset to um, generate uh, clean energy is, is a really exciting one. Uh, no other city has um, sort of proposed this level of solar generation within city limits. A lot of solar projects of this scale happened outside the city. Um, and so that alone is, is something that's really sort of radical for us. Um, in terms of what it takes, you know, I think it's a bold vision, it's leadership. Um, it's really taking the time to inform uh, the community about what, you know, what's the benefit of having solar energy powering buildings. Um, right now, you know, most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Uh, the idea that we can generate clean energy to power all of our municipal operations is really incredible. Um, you know, the city of Detroit in terms of buildings, if you think about um, police precincts, fire stations, um, rec centers, you know, those are all buildings that, you know, require electricity. Um, so to be able to power those and, you know, say that they're completely clean, it's, it's really, really amazing. And it really gets at one of our key goals, you know, I guess, I mean, most of your uh, listeners probably know this, but uh, buildings are one of the biggest sort of generators of greenhouse gas emissions. And so taking that sort of sector uh, of buildings um, from our inventory, uh, it, it's really key. Um, so yeah, it's it's monumental. It, it's, uh, it takes a lot of people and, and I think a bold vision, uh, but you could imagine that it also takes a lot of time and a lot of dedication. Um, yeah, and, and honestly, a lot of excitement. We have great community partners uh, that are helping us with the initiative on the community engagement side. Um, and yeah, we're excited to see where it goes, you know, so stay tuned for sure. Well, well, thank you for talking about that. I think that one of the questions that uh, skeptics, uh, people who are skeptical about all of this work have is like, oh, there's all of this jargon, as you pointed out earlier, and there's all these initiatives, but how do you really make them happen you know how do you how do you make them real and um it's just very exciting to hear because about the vision because i think big bold visions also are 
motivating, right? You know, people uh, can uh, rally around and get excited. So it seems like we have both the practical steps and the vision in play here. So can't wait to be talking to you a few years from now and hearing um, about what the progress is. Um, you know, before we went live, Maria, we were talking about the United Nations and, you know, COP, COP 28 that just completed a month ago in Dubai and how Bloomberg had uh, assembled 150 mayors from uh, major cities uh, around our country to have sort of a mayor's innovation conversation. And um, from some of the things that I've read, I wasn't there at COP28, but from <laughs> some of the things that I've read, um, one of the topics was how cities can better engage youth in local climate efforts. Do you, what's your reaction to that? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I definitely think we're living in a time where um yeah we are competing you know the the news uh cycle is uh feels really dire um and i don't blame you know all the young people who would rather tune in into sort of instagram or tiktok to see other things that are in uh news about how the the planet's warming you know on the other hand um, I'm really encouraged and, and truly sort of amazed by the leadership young, pe young people are taking across the world, uh, really, um, and, and the fact that they're seeing um, sort of social justice and climate being really related. Uh, and I see that in Detroit as well. You know, I think there's a movement. So if we have young people listening, or tuning in, uh, definitely find sort of like your local, um, your local tribe, your local people who are already doing the work. Because I mean, they might be hard to find, but also they might be really easy to find because we are now so connected through social media. Um, we, you know, at the city of Detroit have a fellowship program every summer. Uh, you know, so folks that are in college, you know, we really want to have them introduced to municipal government and, and public administration. I think that's a great way to sort of, you know, if you're passionate about making change uh, in working in this field, that could be like a really great opportunity for you to test whether local government's for you. Um, we're also, you know, uh, as government officials and, and folks that work um, sort of in what people might consider a boring job, <laughs> uh, trying to make ourselves available, you know, for podcasts and communications and um, creating fun and exciting sort of documents like the climate strategy to really appeal to um, the next generation. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, inspire uh, those who might be thinking about um, doing something really impactful uh, and, and maybe are curious about local government and, and hopefully get them get them in to you know be the next um, sustainability director deputy you know transportation head you know there's just so many things um, that require that uh, young perspective and um, so, Definitely something that we we're doing in terms of our communications, but also you know, uh, hopefully once the weather breaks, and have some opportunities like volunteering or just like gathering as a community, and, and really all are welcomed no matter no matter what age. So, so your goal is to make sure that a talented next gen person takes your job. Good for you. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I have hope and I very much feel like a dinosaur sometimes I'm just like I don't I'm not a TikTok I don't understand but <laughs> I have a 17 year old niece that keeps me honest and up to date so <laughs> find the young people in your life that can do that for you <laughs> oh that's wonderful so so you know you've kind of been talking about this all along um but are there um any other tools or tactics that you can share that the city is using to help implement all these changes um, to make Detroit a, a climate sustainable city? 
Yeah, we, um, you know, we're fortunate enough that we have uh, really great philanthropic donors, you know, the Cresby Foundation uh, supported the climate strategy and with it, um, a portion of the funds went to mini grants. So we were lucky enough that um, there's, I mean, there's no shortage of amazing organizations doing amazing work across the city. Uh, and so these grants, uh, which were really $5,000 to implement changes that the organizations were already either planning to, or, you know, maybe they had a shortfall or a gap in funding that they needed $5,000 for something, you know, they could apply for these mini grants. And, um, you know, we had Arts and Scraps, which is a great organization, um, be awarded one of the grants, you know, and, and they take materials that would otherwise go to waste um, and really, um, I could do something with. <laughs> okay. Well, um, they repurpose them. They they yeah. repurpose them. In part, they're a great organization. I've seen their work over the year. Fabulous, so fabulous choice. Yeah. So, in in the, that was the fun thing too. You know, part of the uh, climate strategy, part of the engagement, uh, included the um, CEAC, which is the Climate Equity and um, Action Council. Um, and they selected the winners for the mini grants, you know, and, um, you know, that those are community driven grassroots efforts that, you know, we're trying to support more of, uh, you know, right now the city has neighborhood beautification grants available, uh, and no one's to say, you know, beautification could be anything that you deem sort of beautiful you know if you want to turn your uh community garden into native plants that's a great use um there's already so much work that we're trying to sort of infuse um you know whether it's through these mini grants or through capacity building and um, to really get to our goals um and and yeah it's really exciting to see but uh we also want to be really humble and available you know if there are ideas that uh, we could be um, putting in place to accelerate that change at the community level. Like we are all ears. Uh, we're a really small team right now, but um, I'm very accessible. Uh, so, you know, our email sustainability at detroitmy.gov is always being checked by myself and Zach. Uh, if, you know, there's conversations, meetings, uh, initiatives, programs, we would love to hear how we can support. Well, that's th those are great examples, and how wonderful to hear that those resources are available to get right down into the community level to be put to use. That's that's a wonderful tool to add to your toolkit as you tackle these big, huge goals. <laughs> that's really inspirational. So, speaking of inspiration, um, are there any uh, examples that you can share? about where you find inspiration, whether that's in Detroit or elsewhere to help in, that help you be inspired to do your work? Yeah, um, wow. <laughs> it's, uh, I say wow, because it could be really overwhelming to uh, one, feel like you have agency to sort of tackle some of these big problems. It, it sometimes can feel like your little drop in the bucket is not gonna be enough. Um, but I would encourage everyone um, to think differently that, you know, the arc of how society has been moving is, is hopefully like if you want <laughs> on like a really positive day, you can see progress being done. Um, and, and it takes a lot of sort of energy and, and sort of positive attitude to kind of like go out there and feel like you can do something too um I guess to sort of refill like my cup you know when I am feeling a little disheartened and um having a tough day um I love to sort of go to some of our amazing parks in the city of Detroit 
Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how many gems we have. I mentioned how I love uh, the Jefferson Chalmers community. They have amazing riverfront parks. Um, and it's great to really go out in nature and sort of like take in um, things that have been, you know, living through really harsh weather, harsh conditions, and that, you know, spring back to life uh, in the summer um, and really sort of take a moment to realize that you're just one little piece of a much bigger sort of ecosystem and, and why it's worth to sort of, you know, keep pursuing um, these changes, both big and small, uh, and how we can all sort of take part on um, trying to make our communities better from whatever perspective, whatever you have to bring. I think we all have uh, different strengths, different passions uh, that can all be applied uh, to really chip away at, at, at you know this moment in time where we're experiencing so much um, sort of climate anxiety, right? So like also being cognizant that sometimes it's okay to step away of the work, you know, and uh, take a moment to sort of um, take care of yourself, take care of your family and say, you know, there are other really good people taking leadership and that's great. And then when you're ready to get back at it, um, you know, then bring, bring all that energy back. So that's usually what I do. And, you know, I just came from spending some time with my family in Ecuador. And so that was, really great and it's you know just really inspiring um projects that I think many didn't think could happen have happened um Quito just like introduced a metro system which is underground you know Quito is a city that has earthquakes and people are like that's never gonna work and it has worked so like it's really inspiring to see projects that you know a lot of people spend a lot of time planning for and then they come to life. So I would say, you know, anyone feeling a little um, discouraged, if there are any planning meetings, any projects that you really support around, you know, transit, um, go to those meetings, advocate, you know, like speak up for the things that you love because you never know how that voice is really gonna impact sort of like the next decisions for those big projects that might happen in shorter time than you imagine. I mean, I know that 10 years sounds insanely long, but it goes by so quick once you hit 30. <laughs> All the years just like start uh, going by super quickly. So uh, <laughs> they, you know, it be, there's gonna be transformational projects that you can lend your voice on today that could happen within your lifetime. And I think it, it's worth sort of, knowing that. Well, those are very inspirational words for us to end our time together with, you know, it's, it's that whole, that whole idea that begin, begin where you can, you, you never know what ripples of impact you'll have from even the smallest things. And, and take um, that perspective and inspiration. I agree with you. Some of the most amazing things are happening in the neighborhoods with parks and um, gardens and things that residents in the neighborhood have come together to support and create. You know, that's really such an important part of of um, community and um, in the long run, that's what's gonna get us there uh, as well as policymakers like you who are there behind the scenes trying to get the resources and uh, put the frameworks together to, to make it all happen. So thank you so much for joining us today, Maria. And we, you know, I just wish you the best of luck in your work. We're lucky to have you with us here in Detroit. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Terry. Um, thank you for lending your platform to really uh, inform and educate residents and yeah, keep spreading sort of the good energy of you know all the work we can do together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Sustainable Business Network Detroit, the Green Stream Podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Make sure to follow us on sbn-detroit.org and stay tuned for more conversations on sustainability from inside and around the city.